And um, now what we're going to do is actually give you a chance to kind of see how the team would work together. And um, I'm going to introduce the next speakers. Uh, let's see, Ben, I think you may be speaking first. Is that correct? Yep. So I've already introduced Ben, but after Ben, we'll be hearing from Bill Reddy. And I'm, these are going to be really short. You have bios, I think, of these folks. So I'm just going to hit the highlights. Bill Reddy is a, national, a nationally board certified licensed acupuncturist and has, um, is the president of the Acupuncture Society of Virginia and has been vice president of the American Association of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. Uh, Dr. Gerald Klum will be speaking later. And um, he is a um, national and international expert in the field of chiropractic health care and is the president emeritus of Life Chiropractic College West and on the faculty of Life University now. Um, all of these people have other great things. I'm skipping over that. And then we'll also be he hearing from Emily Telfair, uh, who is a, has a degree in naturopathic medicine from Bastyr University and practices naturopathic medicine in the state of Maryland. She's also past president of the Maryland Naturopathic Doctors Association. So you're going to hear from Ben, and then part of the team will be hearing from acupuncture, chiropractic, and naturopathic experts. Thanks, Ben. Great. Okay. Well, if you thought I talked fast on that last part, wait for this part, because I only have five minutes. Um, luckily, in New York, we know how to talk fast. So, um, so basically, I think our, our main purpose on this panel is to illustrate the degree to which integrative health and whole health is really a team sport. It's not something that the physician does alone. It's not something the nurse or the acupuncturist does alone. It's something we all have to do together. And so uh, I'm going to just share a couple of examples of VA programs that really illustrate that and actually have some data that's accumulating of really successful outcomes, uh, just so that you see how we're approaching it in the BA. A really core part of this whole concept is that this is care that has to be delivered by a team. So um, the two examples I'm going to give, the first one is from Atlanta and one is from Tampa. The first is the Empower Veterans Program, or we call it EVP, Intensive Whole Health Coaching for Veterans with High Impact Chronic Pain. This is specifically a pain program, but it really aims at the whole person, so it aims at the pain and the person's experience of pain. And the lead on this is a wonderful guy named Michael Sanger, who's uh, been really leading the charge on this in Atlanta and is now working on spreading this to a number of the sites around the country. I mean, so what is EVP? It's a 10-week group-oriented program, 30 hours total, and it includes three different approaches. So there's um, this whole health kind of coaching or reorientation um, approach, uh, and that goes along with mindfulness training. There's acceptance and commitment therapy, which people may or not be aware of. It's a very powerful uh, sort of modification of cognitive behavioral therapy that really focuses around values and what's important to the patient as part of the core healing. And then there's a mindful movement component. And basically, every time veterans get together, and this is just half the course, but I thought I'd show you, they have a, a, a three-hour experience that includes all three of these approaches. So they move. They talk to each other, they practice mindfulness, and every time they do it, they come back for 10 weeks running, and they uh, experience each of those things. People are referred into this. This really looks to serve a pretty uh, intensely uh, in-need population. It's a pretty intensive approach if you think about committing yourself to three hours a week for 10 weeks. It's a big commitment, so a lot of the guys in this are really significantly disabled on significant opioids or other medications and really ready for the help. Uh, so this is not sort of the, you know, whole health light that just everybody participates in. So they've done some great research. They've had over uh, almost 400 graduates, I think over 400 now, and they've done before and after estimates. They've shown improved quality of life, less depression, less pain interference, which is what uh, General Schoolmaker was talking about regarding the impact of pain on your life, not just 0 to 10, but what is it doing to your life improve mobility, et cetera. They haven't been able to look yet at the impact on opioid use, but at least preliminary data suggests that people going through EVP are ending up with significantly less opioid use. And uh, the concept is the pain is no longer in control. So just to show you a few slides, and we don't have to go into this in detail, uh, this is a measure on the right-hand side of your slide there is pain interference. These are what's called effect size. So delta, the, uh, the I can't remember, it's the, uh, Who's D effect? Cohen's D. Is that the right? Yeah. yeah. So this is the size of the effect, and anything over 0.3 is a pretty significant effect. And you can see that the change from before to after in the impact that pain is having 
on people's activities, social life, work, et cetera, uh, quite a significant effect before and after EVP. Also looked at pain acceptance, which is sort of in the same category, and you can see the change before and after, also significant quality of life. Um, there's a questionnaire they use about depression, and obviously, as you know, suicide prevention and, and activist treatment of depression, a huge priority in VA now, so significant improvement on depression. And then one of the questions on the PHQ-9 is actually about suicidal thinking and also a significant decline in that from before to after the program. And this is just to give it a face and one person. I can't unblow myself up, but I can change little things. And before you know it, chronic pain goes from pretty much the number one thing to something that's just kind of in the background. So it's not about getting to zero on the pain scale. It's about you might stay at six or five or eight or four, but it's in the background. I have a life. I have new skills. I have a way to make this uh, bring meaning back into my life even while I have the pain. So this is just one example. And you saw the team there, chaplain, social worker, uh, rec therapist, and the physician is kind of in the background. Uh, so one other program I want to share, and I'll, I'll talk even faster now, this is called the Thrive Program. This is one that does involve the physician directly, but also a whole other team. The lead here is Jackie Paykel, who's actually an uh, OBGYN at Tampa, and who developed this program and is now spreading it around the country. It's been primarily offered to women. She's a women's health doc, and she started this program in women. Um, but now it's actually being piloted in men, so we'll see how well the benefits that we've seen in women veterans translates over. So who is the team for this? Uh, the staff for this is a physician or an NP or a PA, a social worker, a psychologist, and then a number of guest speakers from specific disciplines. I'll show you who they are. This is also, this is actually a 14-week course. It's two hours each time. And every time they do it, they do mindfulness. They have homework. They usually do some movement. And um, they do that weekly for 14 weeks. Uh, this is the team, the physician social worker, psychologist, they bring in a pharmacist, they bring in a rec therapist, nutritionist, uh, MOVE is a weight loss program in the VA, so they, uh, at the different parts of the program, they bring in different practitioners. And it's, so it's really a team approach. And one thing that's really great is that this has been um, built as what's called a group medical visit. So when you talk about sustainability and the ability to pay for it, this actually allows the visit to be, quote, billed or counted as a physician visit. But because it's a group experiencing all at once, they get a lot more out of that physician time. But the physician also gets, quote, workload credit for leading a group. So it's a very powerful sort of model for how this can be financially sustainable across VA. These are the goals uh, also aimed at employees and, and improving their experience. Uh, these are the core components of the model. It includes positive psychology, acceptance, commitment therapy. That's a common theme. This is very popular in vets, partly because there's so much, quote, moral injury where the, the meaning of their life needs to be re kind of uh, presented in front based on the challenging memories and experiences people are dealing with. So, and it builds in mindfulness, exercise, et cetera. Um, so, just to quick a little bit about their data, they've had data on 160 people so far, although this is spreading rapidly. And you can see the before and after improvements in depression, anxiety, satisfaction, and neuroplastic neuroplasticity, which is about sort of the ability to respond to change and stress. So really, again, impressive results. Uh, Dr. Paykel just recently went to New Orleans and trained a group of practitioners there to bring this to the New Orleans VA. And really, there's a lot of interest in spreading this around VA. One question I have is whether this is going to work in men. Um, obviously, you know, we have a lot of women veterans, and even if it works primarily in women, um, that's okay because we have a lot of women veterans in need of this. It's going to be interesting to see if the social support and kind of this group approach is, gets as high an uptake in men. Will the men really come through week 14, or will they get to week 6 or 7 and say, when are the women going to get here? And then, you know, perhaps drop out. That's the fear of the, of the... And so they're actually looking at, is the 14-week model also right for men? I don't need to generalize about men, but, you know. Um, is the 14-week model right? Is a, is a shorter model going to be more effective? Uh, and so they're just now rolling out their first few groups in, in men veterans to see how effective that is. So again, just another example of how this is really an interdisciplinary effort. This one does happen to involve the MD. They're not, you know, they're just part of the team. And so this is really the way we think it should go, that it's a team sport and it, it sort of takes a village to make this whole health approach work. 
I'll stop there. I'm going to shift everything here just a little bit so I can see it along the way. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a it's, it's a thrill to be here and participate in this. I'm going to represent the perspective of the chiropractic community and, and the chiropractic component of this discussion. I'm going to try and d drill down a little bit and get a little bit more narrow, uh, as you might expect, as we move a little bit deeper into the discussion. The reality is we've got a tremendous gap, and the gap is killing us as a nation. And that gap exists between uh, the, the knowledge and the, the materials and the information we have to work with and the practices, policies, payments, and the perspectives of the system. It's what we've heard talked about here for the past hour and a half. And all of these things are contributing to creating this gap. And the task that government has, the task that we have, is to try and do things that fill that gap in a constructive and productive fashion. You've heard other speakers this morning talk about the fact that we're transitioning out of an infectious disease management world into a chronic conditions-oriented world. We're also moving out of a provider-dominated world to a world that's, that, is a, that is dominated by lifestyle issues, that's dominated by genetic issues, dominated by the involvement of the individual. And we've seen the tra transition in patients from the patient uh, who is, just does what they're told to the patient that's going to tell you what they're going to do and how it's going to be done and ultimately, we're seeing the transition from fix to prevent. Some of the easy and low-hanging fruit for this discussion, the reality that we think about when we think of health care is we think about the things that kill us quickly and kill us in, in horrific ways. Cancer, heart disease, stroke, so on. These are the things that come to our mind most often. But worldwide, the number one cause of disability is not cancer, is not heart disease, is not stroke, it's in fact spinal pain. If we take it a little bit further and we think about the moment that we're in relative to this pain, and we look at the overall world of chronic pain here in the United States, and the opioid use environment that we're in right at this moment, we have a perfect storm that demands change and demands an end of business as usual. And we have an urgency that calls for new players, new practices, new strategies to get this done. Looking at the dollars and cents, imagine this, if you will. These are the 2010 data. In the United States, we spend $600 billion on pain. If we look at the cost that we spend on cancer treatment, the cost we spend on heart disease treatment, combine them together, and it's less money than we spend on pain in the United States. We're getting a not so good return on the investment, and we're getting an awful significant downside to the approaches and the treatments to that management that we are employing. One quarter of all opioid prescriptions written in the United States are written for low back pain. When all of the guidelines from the Institute of Medicine, the CDC, the Food and Drug, the Joint Commission say don't do it. And if you do do it for a day or two, maybe three or four, but that's it. But instead that patient, as the general made reference to, gets that handful, that full bottle, and in six weeks they're addicted. We look at the IOM report, we look at the FDA report, we look at the CDC guidelines, and they have one thing in common, non-opioid approaches and non-pharmacological care. That's the order and the recommendation from the hierarchy of the system across the system. And we now have the opportunity to try and implement this across the board, as, it, as I said before, through practice, through policy, and so on, and in the perspective of the care that we offer. Now, for any of you that can read this slide, you're doing much better than I am based upon where you're sitting. <laughs> but let me just jump to a couple of highlights. This is an analysis that was published three weeks ago from the state of New Hampshire dealing with the management of low back pain in the non-Medicare, non-Medicaid environment based on 2013 and 2014 data. When chiropractic care is present, the costs are $1,513. When they're not, the costs were $6,766. A year later, the numbers went to $2,007,000. If we look at the opioid impact component, in 2013, when chiropractic care was available in this environment, the cost of opioids was $154. When it wasn't available, the cost of opioids jumped four times to almost $600. A year later, the same ratio. 200 to 900. The bottom line is we've had significant costs. If we look at the, what that data tells us, 
is that in 2013 and in 2014, there was 74% lower opioid costs, 78% lower clinical care costs associated with the use of chiropractic care. We take it down another year, and it was 78 and 71. The bigger issue is the lifetime utilization within our society of chiropractic care is about 20, a quarter to a half of the population. 8.4 to 14% of the population use chiropractic care on an annual basis, and the primary reason they do is for back pain and neck pain. But the important, and the thing I'd like you to take away from my part of this discussion, is the changes. This is from a literature that was published less than three months ago, published in Spine, and it was an analysis of the National Health Interview Survey regarding the impacts of chiropractic care. And that the, the consumers that responded found that chiropractic care gave them a sense of control over their health, almost a third of the population that responded. It helped to reduce their stress level or help them relax 40%. It helped them sleep better 42%. It made it easier to cope with their health problems 4 out of 10 and improve their overall health and well-being 67% of that population. The general made reference to talking about the, the issues associated with mood, with activity, with sleep, and with stress. And I think if you look at that slide, it embraces all of those. I'm asking six things on behalf of, of my world in this discussion. We need to increase the budget of the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health to fund the comparative research and systematic reviews needed to better understand the clinical and economic value of integrated care. We need to address the restrictions inherent in the Medicare system related to payment of various forms of integrative care. And we need to encourage the full implementation of non-pharmacological approaches in pain management. We need to expand the active duty, and military, excuse me, active duty military and veterans access to integrative care and, provide, and have it provided by persons with the, with the capacity and the expertise in those disciplines. We need to appreciate and respect the feedback of consumer-driven information, such as the National Health Interview Survey, my apology for the slide error, related to complementary care, as I've illustrated relative to chiropractic care, and then ultimately support and implement the spirit and intent of Section 2706 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, my name is Emily Telfair. I'm a naturopathic doctor practicing nearby in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'll be sharing with you the, um, an introduction to naturopathic medicine, which may be new to some of you, and also helping you understand the perspective we would take in addressing um, chronic pain by addressing the underlying cause. So to begin a discussion of naturopathic medicine, it's important to remember it is actually in our nature to be well, and that we are an integral part of nature. What happens is that disease occurs when we forget this, and we're in a healthcare system that systemically has forgotten that it's in our nature to be well. So naturopathic <laughs> doctors are physician-level trained healthcare providers who emphasize disease prevention and patient empowerment to help restore health and improve vitality. And we do this by addressing the underlying cause of disease and illness using low cost, minimally invasive therapies um, as much as possible. And our training occurs um, at one of five naturopathic medical schools, it's a, which is a four-year postgraduate medical training with a strong foundation in the basic medical sciences um, and learning um, traditional diagnostic techniques and naturopathic therapeutics. And it's a 4,100-hour training program that includes 1,500 hours of direct patient care. And what I love about this profession most is the wide um, toolkit of therapies available to naturopathic doctors since our core training includes diet and lifestyle therapies, uh, clinical um, nutrition, herbal medicine, homeopathy, hydrotherapy, and even we even learn physical medicine techniques. So applying this to an individual with chronic pain, the approach naturopathic doctors take is at first we want to listen to the whole story because in that story are the clues to why this acute pain went and became chronic. And then in the treatment plan, using a multi-tiered approach to reduce inflammation, to help restore balance to systems that have become stressed, like the nervous system or the adrenals, um, which regulate our stress hormones. 
and also addressing the concurrent mood disorders that often accompany chronic pain. And then, of course, wanting to welcome in a team approach, as we've been discussing here, and remembering the importance of closing the loop and addressing practitioner self-care, because if the person healing the uh, patient is also in pain um, and hasn't addressed their own issues, um, that's going to impact um, how they uh, support the patient clinically. So I get curious when a person comes in with pain, what is underneath? Because pain is the symptom, but it understanding the cause is just as important to know how to address treatment. So I'm looking for, are there structural issues going on? Is there an infectious component? Or does the person have an autoimmune disorder? But what I most often see is underneath there is trauma. Underneath there is uh, fear. Um, there's holding on to wanting the past to have been different. And this um, links to what Dr. Chesney referenced earlier, the re relevance to addressing adverse childhood experiences for individuals with chronic pain. I have seen this repeatedly, not just with pain, but other chronic illnesses um, in, tr in practice, um, that the early experiences of um, unpredictable stressors and losses that people face in childhood are predictive for chronic illness in adulthood. And if they go unaddressed, then we've really not been able to treat the cause. And research continues to um, reflect this, showing how these early um, childhood traumas link to inflammatory path pathways developing early in life, that when subsequent um, traumas um, develop, that the person's way more susceptible to developing pain and if it becoming chronic. So this graph further illustrates that when initially we have some acute stresses, the body might be able to bounce back um, and go into the green or homeostasis uh, quite easily. But when those stresses persist, our mechanisms for regulation um, start to fail. And those stress hormones start to become, um, the cortisol levels go down and we become exhausted. So the treatment plan begins with calming down that inflammation and those excitatory messengers that get set up when there's been injury. So we may use herbal therapies. Um, I frequently use homeopathy, especially before and after surgeries, if we want to be on that preventative end of minimizing the need or the amount of opioids where people can often initially become addicted. So Arnica is a good friend in that regard. Um, I often use nutrition to also help manage inflammation. And then building resiliency to stress. There's actually a whole class of herbs called adaptogens, which literally help our body adapt to stress. To go back to that green section in the graph earlier, to come back to homeostasis. I even use different uh, nutrients like magnesium or B vitamins to also nourish the body. And the one modality I've seen work more than any other in treatment is that of mindfulness. It is available to us all the time, and it's free. <laughs> and it is one of the most powerful tools to actually help a person shift their relationship to their pain. And I'd like to um, end with um, a patient's story. Uh, this is Dr. Joe Strauss, who is an osteopathic physician, an orthopedic trauma surgeon, and a captain in the US Navy. And he came to me several months uh, um, before his initial deployment to Kandahar, Afghanistan in 2009. He was suffering from very severe anxiety and chronic headaches. And here he was getting ready to deploy and go into a trauma center in Kandahar. So in his, um, we addressed his um, chronic inflammation, his anxiety, and what later became known to be his post-traumatic stress disorder from multiple experiences of ACEs in his childhood. Some of the things he told me he'd never told, he'd only told one other person in his whole life about of traumas that he'd experienced. So we did some good work before he left, and when he came back, and for over the last eight years, we've continued to address his trauma, and now he has a whole toolkit of therapies that he's able to use, particularly mindfulness, he says, was most um, impactful. And he says that through naturopathic care, he was able to reconnect with himself as an individual while feeling fully heard. And he really, um, when I talked to him recently, he said, just let them know it's all about the love. Because that's really where he was able to arrive back to within himself and how that has transformed his ability to care for others uh, because he's still a trauma surgeon. He's still serving our country in the Navy Reserves. And if we aren't helping to heal the healers, 
Again, we've really missed the boat because he's somebody who can prescribe opioids. And if he's not able to manage and address his own pain, that can highly influence how he treats others um, in pain. So the opioid epidemic is in front of us. And, um, and through this quote in Mary, from Mary Oliver, I'll end with, I don't ask for the sights in front of me to change, only the depth of my seeing. We all see what's in front of us. An opioid epidemic, which is really in front reflective of the chronic pain epidemic. But from this discussion today and learning about all these modalities, we see that between pr practitioners and policymakers, we can really help shift and increase access to what patients have available to them for treatment. Thank you for your time. Well, last but not least, uh, my name is Bill Reddy. I'm a nationally certified uh, acupuncturist, and I um, also serve on the board of directors of the Integrative Health Policy Consortium. And today I'd like to assert that acupuncture can really be a major part in combating uh, both the opioid and the pain crisis in the United States. And so just a little about the infrastructure of what we have is that there's 34,000 practitioners across the nation we have 60 accredited medical schools that uh, teach acupuncture. And uh, in the top, in terms of the US News and World Report, the top five hospitals in the country currently have acupuncture services offered. However, it's a little bit, it's more outpatient care. It's not like they offer uh, 60 acupuncturists, like uh, not Georgetown, let's see. Uh, Johns Hopkins University has maybe three acupuncturists. So we're growing. And uh, Dr. Kligler already mentioned about the, uh, the VA, so I'll continue. And so we're, we're distributed across the nation. Uh, you can see that the red states are the ones, the dark red have the most acupuncturists of over 1,000 per state. And uh, this, this is a little bit, I wouldn't take pictures of it because California, I know have about 8,000, but this particular reference has about half that. But it does give you an idea that there are some states that we really don't have a whole lot of acupuncturists in, such as West Virginia or North, uh, North Dakota, and others like Florida and New, New York and uh, California do have quite a few of us. So in terms of how we do, in, uh, as far as the studies of acupuncture, is that there's over 7,000 studies when you uh, type in PubMed and over 27,000 studies on acupuncture in terms of general conditions that we treat. And that uh, in terms of uh, being more effective, there's a, uh, a study where they did a meta-analysis of, um, of using opioids for chronic pain, and they said they don't really recommend it. Acute pain, fine, but chronic, not so much. And that's where acupuncture is really, really powerful. And also, you can see that when acupuncture is used, there's a 60% reduction in opioids. So again, we can really be part of the problem. We just need to be implemented, and we need to have regulation to allow more insurance coverage. Now, as of now, there's, uh, we are at a um, essential health benefit in the Affordable Care Act in six states. That means 100% of insurance companies cover us. But in other states, basically people who can pay out of pocket will have our services and no one else, and that's wrong. And also something that we deal with the pain side, but we also deal with the addiction side as well. And there's a group called the National Acupuncture Detox Association. It's been around since 1975 is when they started using this protocol in New York. And uh, at this time, there's 23 states that use it. Uh, there's over 40 countries that use this protocol as well that uses auricular acupuncture, and it's a five-point protocol. Very, very effective. And instead of just talking about pain, I'd also like to point out that uh, the NIH and the World Health Organization did look at the studies. This is about 30 years ago. And you can see that everything from neurological issues to um, ear, nose, and throat, emotional conditions, we treat quite the gamut. And the cost is very reasonable as well. This, this uh, is a few years old, but it indicates that about $75 is the cost of a treatment across the nation, which again, isn't really outlandish compared to a knee replacement, which is about 45 grand. And so uh, the AHRQ had did, uh, has 
have done a, um, a study that uh, looked at surveys for two years at 89,000 acupuncture patients. And what they found was that 96% of the respondents said that they would recommend their acupuncturist to their friends or family. So that's pretty strong, and 99% said that they reported good, very good, or excellent service. So I think that that's just really outstanding in terms of uh, just what we have to offer. And acupuncture is incredibly safe as well. It's been in the country for over, over 50 years. Well, actually, licensed, it's, it's uh, kind of spotty. We currently are licensed in 45 states, so we still um, are growing. But uh, not one person has died in the past 50 years from acupuncture. And in terms of the uh, adverse events, uh, no one has, uh, no real serious injuries have occurred. <coughs> so, uh, so what I envision is really an acupuncturist just being part of a patient-centered care model where we're working together as a team. We can have a chiropractor, we can have an acupuncturist, we can have a naturopath at the table along with the physician, and that way we can let the patient <coughs> choose what they feel is most comfortable for their care. Thanks for your time. Before I call up our phenomenal executive director for IHPC, Susan Hager, who I asked to take an interim role two or three years ago. <laughs> She's done a wonderful job. So what you've heard today, you've heard several words, and this is just an introduction. It's very exciting that this caucus will be ongoing, that we're planning uh, the potential of other briefings more in depth about various uh, clinical topics, environmental topics, advocacy and policy topics. You've heard about integrative health. Please remember integrative health is the best of conventional and other, not necessarily alternative, but other ways to look at illness as well as health and healthcare. You've heard about a team approach, it takes a village. Well, the team approach is very important. I'm gonna be audacious to say and I think I can as an MD, it's not about a hierarchy. It's not about a hierarchy. It's about people coming with humility, with their different disciplines, and bringing the best that they have to the patient in a very equal and pluralistic fashion. It's also about the opioid crisis. And again, it's not about the opioid crisis. We are having an epidemic of people that are suffering, that have lost their way in the journey of life. They have pain and they have emotional p suffering. That is what we should focus on. Of course, the opioid situation, overuse, abuse, has heightened this because people are dying of it. We have to focus on this, but we need to remember, in order to achieve three words for our healthcare system, we need to approach this as the pain crisis, not just the opioid crisis. Those three words that I would like to ask you to focus on, guide your visions, pray on, is a healthcare system in the United States based on prevention, wellness, and well-being. Thank you. Susan, 